welcome. My name is Tom Goldsby. I'm coming to you from Knoxville, Tennessee, and I'll be serving as your host for today's masterclass session titled Paper Free Warehouse, What Tech Can Get You There? And we're pleased to welcome Jamie Sterling as our primary presenter today. Um, so let me just uh, introduce myself a little bit more formally. I'm a professor of supply chain management at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And uh, I also serve as the Haslam Chair of Logistics at, at UT. And uh, joining me today is Jamie Sterling. Jamie uh, is uh, a, uh, an eight-year veteran of Kerber Supply Chain. Uh, he's been involved in the supply chain uh, for, for many years, uh, however, and, and he's currently the Director of International Sales and Operations. He heads up software sales in the Asia Pacific region for Kerber Supply Chain. Uh, more than 10 years of supply chain experience, including third-party services in cold chain. Like I said, eight years with Kerber Supply Chain, uh, fulfilling various roles in North America and Asia. So, Jamie, it's great to have you with us today. Thanks, Tom. I mean, you make me feel uh, old. Uh, just for the for the record, there, I'm only 30, right? So. Uh... <laughs> Well, you've been a consumer of supply chain your entire life, but you've been active in, in managing and advising supply chain for uh, for more than 10 years, and we're looking forward to tapping into some of that experience today. Hey, before I hand things over to Jamie, though, let's go over some uh, some key points. Uh, for some of you, you may be joining us for the first time, for instance, and might be wondering why we're here and what's the purpose of this masterclass. Uh, the purpose of this masterclass series is to tackle the challenges of today's increasingly complex supply chain, bringing you best practices and innovative thinking from academics like myself, as well as industry insiders and senior leaders like Jamie. Uh, maybe no topic is as perplexing today as delivering on the multiple bottom lines that sustainability presents, delivering on business objectives, conserving our physical environment, and looking out for the well-being of our associate supply chain partners and larger society and communities in which we operate. So our intention is to educate and inform, illuminating how the pursuit of sustainability done well can advance your business. So today is the, uh, the fourth and final session in this particular masterclass series. Uh, if you missed any of the previous three sessions, however, don't fret. Uh, they're all recorded and available to you on demand and uh, you'll have access uh, to those videos uh, upon the conclusion of today's session. Also, I'm gonna encourage you to take a look at the complete catalog of Kerber Supply Chain Masterclass sessions that we've delivered in the past. Uh, you see that the topics covering, again, a very wide assortment of topics across the spectrum of supply chain management, looking at how advanced practices and technology can help us to contend with complexity. So uh, we're, we've got seven masterclass series uh, in the books and we're, we're about ready to, to wrap this one up. And uh, again, feel free to, to access the full catalog. Let's go over a little housekeeping though, uh, just to get you comfortable and situated with what's in store for today. All of your phone lines are muted out there, so don't be too concerned about any background noise you might have at your home or workplace. Uh, maybe your home is your workplace these days. Uh, our session is again recorded for later viewing and you're going to get a link to the on-demand video and presentation materials within 48 hours uh, of this moment. I again encourage you to be involved in today's sessions by submitting questions to us. Just go to the GoToWebinar menu where you see the questions tab and uh, enter those questions at any time during today's session. We'll be sure to address those toward the end of our time. Also, while you're in the GoToWebinar menu, check out the industry report that complements today's session. It's titled Sustainability and the Supply Chain, Reducing Environmental Impact and Managing Your Cost. So with that, let's go ahead and get into today's topic. It's uh, paper-free warehouses. What tech can get you there? And I thought I would just level set a little bit here uh, to get us started uh, with what I recognize as a somewhat oversimplified view of the activities and decisions that take place in a typical warehouse from receiving and put away to order selection, the pick, pack, and ship activities to serve customers, as well as what I call the all the while activities associated with safety, productivity, product integrity, and provenance, regulatory, and environmental record keeping. My point is that 
tracking informing and reporting on these activities requires mind-boggling amounts of data and in conventional settings that data means mountains of documentation paper and that that mountain is growing uh, every single day uh, in a conventional setting so I was, I was, in fact I was trying to find a source for how many documents pieces of information are required to support the fulfillment of a single order and I simply could not track that down. Maybe it's too difficult to say, but it's immense. If we can move on to the next slide. That mountain, as I indicated, of, of data and information and documentation is only growing because complexity is increasing and causing even more touches on product. And uh, we think of warehouses as places where product flows. And absolutely it should be, but right along with that product flow is gonna be information flow. And as I indicated, it's growing in complexity. Here's some observations I'd like to, to, to serve up. Warehouses are growing in number and in size. Uh, now you might be thinking a lot of the, the warehouses today might be those smaller last mile urban fulfillment centers. And, and those are certainly growing in number but even those uh, centers take up an awful lot of space. Uh, real estate data show that DCs uh, outside of those urban fulfillment centers are a third larger today than they were 15 years ago. And a lot of that order picking that takes place uh, to serve the last mile business or consumer takes up a lot more space, requires a lot more people. Uh, just as we see skew proliferation, product customization and market segmentation lend to greater variety in products stored in each of those facilities. Trying to position that product closer to the customer and today's customers demanding an ever-growing assortment of goods. You know, the burden on these facilities is changing too, uh, with fewer facilities being what I call full pallet in, full pallet out in nature. Rather, we're breaking down pallets sooner in the supply chain forming mixed pallets and shipping more orders of smaller quantities and greater variety. That then leads to the need for more labor and more space, as I indicated earlier, and, and also real challenges to productivity uh, in light of these realities. Uh, that then leads to my final point here, that a, a larger share of the products that go out the door uh, are also coming back, I should point out that uh, returns are running about 30% for e-commerce these days. And so an exorbitant tax on our systems, not only to get that product out to the customer, but recognizing a lot of it comes back. And then finally, we recognize that a larger, that, that, that accounting and record keeping uh, requirements are heightened as well, not just for compliance purposes, but also in response to customer calls for better transparency in the products and services they purchase. So Jamie, let's turn to you now. I've made the case that today's warehouses are really complex and that complexity is growing. Much of that growing complexity attributed to what I call today's diabolical customer and their, their demands on the system. What are you seeing and how can we contend with this growing complexity and maybe pursue the free environment? Listen, Tom, before I get started, I want to I wanna poke a hole in uh, your returns comment there. Not so much poke a hole. Uh, I learned probably this time last week that we, in, in, in Australia, we have an um, online retail uh, platform. And they are encouraging you buy uh, more than one garment or more than one item. And on a returns policy, they're giving you store credit of one point, a multiplier of 1.2% if you return rather than returning the cash. So I'm thinking to myself, why, what, what's, 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 the, uh, what's the upside here for them? What they're doing is encouraging the returns. They're sitting on the cash. They're gaining interest on the cash. And they're actually considered now a financial institution, not an e-com player. So the market is pivoting. The, the, the suppliers and the vendors and retailers are encouraging people to buy more and return in exchange for store credit. Well, that's amazing. And I, I think we'll agree, though, it's certainly raising complexity and also the sustainability burden, too, right? It's not just taking the product out, but bringing it back and figuring out then how to disposition that item, right? 
Absolutely. I just think it was an interesting example to start off the call. But I, I, again, that's that's an exception. But I think a lot of this is being driven by the, the consumer expectation. As I've got here is evolving. You call it the diabolical consumer. Uh, I mean, we all live for the consumer. Uh, customer is king, ultimately. Let's be honest, we're here to serve our customers, whether or not that's B2B or B2C. <clears throat> but that's changing. Their mentality is changing. Uh, we're seeing a lot more um, a lot more trends towards consumers making eco-friendly decisions and being influenced by a supplier or a, a brand's uh, overall green initiatives or eco-friendly initiatives. Uh, we read yesterday that two-thirds of consumers are actually willing to pay more if, it, if the, their product uh, comes from an eco-friendly either supplier, supply chain, retailer, or whatever it may be. So that's really pushing uh, organizations uh, that we work with to change that market perception, start promoting their product in, ter in, in terms of a green, uh, a green form, I call it. Uh, consumers are stating they have more trust in eco-friendly suppliers and vendors. That goes back. They're willing to pay more. They trust those brands more. They're willing to work with them more um, with, again, that market perception. And then 36% of supply chain businesses are stating that sustainability is a leading initiative within their business. So we're seeing these large organizations, I think we've seen Nike rebuild, or, or sorry, reuse and re, uh, renew their old trainers to build new trainers, right? So, and charge exorbitant prices for these products. Uh, so these initiatives are being led, but they also come with a price tag to the consumer. So I think as the demands are changing, uh, very reactively, we're having to try and get ahead of that, that curve and be a bit more proactive to, um, to accommodate our customers. Um, sorry, go ahead, Matt. So I think when we look at sustainability within supply chain, and we bring that down to sustainability within the warehouse operations, it's broken into four key areas. And I think, Tom, you alluded to some at the start there. No, uh, sorry, location of the warehouse and distribution center. I mean, that's a major factor. You wanna look at your emissions, your CO2 emissions, transportation. Uh, we as e-com uh, e -com consumers now are now expecting higher level of SLA. So now we're seeing these micro fulfillment distribution centers being placed in the urban areas. I think you said, uh, you said earlier as well. These are all major contributing factors. Efficiency of the facility, structural, the, the layout, travel time within the facility, your, your forklift wear and tear, if you're using gas forklifts, your, your, your gas, or sorry, your forklift travel time, your lighting, if you're in cold chain, your largest uh, operating expense is your electricity. Um, you mentioned I come from 3PL um, back, well, it's actually 11 years ago now, my, my first real employer in supply chain based in Belfast in Ireland. Um, he was one of the first globally. He built a ingestion plant right next door to his facility, and he purchases the um, the what they call the silage or the the uh, the uh, waste from farmers, and he actually generates his own electricity and is 100% running off this ingestion plant. Um, so he was one of the first of these first uh, thought leaders when it came to sustainability, and he feeds a lot back into the grid. So. A lot of things to consider. Your lighting as well. Are you in an energy efficient uh, building? But another thing to consider when looking at these four key aspects is what's your baseline metric to measure these against? And we'll go into that shortly as well. Point three, I think I'm not going to touch on too much in this slide because I'm going. that's going to be the topic of our, our conversation. But optimization as well. We need to look at optimization of a warehouse uh, internally from a labor perspective, as well as the flow of goods. The more labor you have equates to the more, uh, sorry, more cars on the road, more transport required. These are all considerations that you need to make. So when we go into the next couple of slides, I'm going to, we're not replacing labor, but we're changing labor. The, the, the way labor's uh, being considered um, is not changing, that mindset's changing. We also want to be efficient within your operation as well. <clears throat> and then the last one is, um, Warehouse sustainability, as I mentioned, can be a really competitive asset for organizations. Uh, as, as we said with the consumer, the consumer expectation, the evolution of paying more uh, for sustainable brands and sustainable products and sustainable supply chain is, uh, is, is, a, is a consumer requirement. To a point now where we're seeing uh, here in Australia, and I'll give another real life example, um, we're, we're seeing in Australia that 
the option for a day one for day four delivery because they're delivering in that postcode or zip code as, as, as it's referred to in North America is being given to the customer. So if you order on a Monday, a prompt is provided to say, hey, we're in this area on a Wednesday. Do you mind waiting for it? And there's a huge uptick in, organi- or, sorry, in consumers um, requesting that more eco-efficient, eco-friendly delivery time because that van or that courier will already be in that area. So there's a total shift there. So that is driving new sales, new market perceptions as well. But today we're going to focus on the paper-free component. Um, Matt? So when we look at the, the distribution uh, within, the, within the four walls of your facility, the paradigm is shifting. Um, as as uh, Tom said, we're getting those large, larger distribution centers, mega, mega distribution centers. Some of these distribution centers we're coming across are football fields upon football fields of size. Uh, to a point we're having organizations who come to us from requesting real life location services for their staff because they're just so damn big, right? Then you have that fulfillment, or we call it micro or urban fulfillment, or micro distribution, or micro fulfillment, which is those those dark stores that Tom spoke about at the start, fulfilling to a postcode or a zip code. Um, just the sheer volume of parcels that are going through some post office facilities can't be handled. So we're now doing sub sortation or sub sub metro sortation facilities as well. And then we look at the various types of orders these facilities are having, or sorry, are handling store replenishment orders or online orders. We're seeing a lot of the micro fulfillment being, or sorry, the online orders being fulfilled from the micro micro fulfillment distribution centers. As Tom also mentioned, higher level of returns. RMAs, it's the returns are just something we've never come across in it, ever. This is all a new paradigm for us. As I said, suppliers and vendors are encouraging returns. These, these organizations are becoming financial institutions, not, not suppliers or vendors, right? Um, they want to encourage you to buy extra sizes, other products, mix and match, pairing, return it. They're giving you free shipping on their returns and they're, they're, they're giving you store credit in, that, in return for that. So there's a financial gain for that organization as well. And then speed, speed to market, up to market perception. I think everyone knows the Amazon effect. Uh, I mean, there's no point educating on everyone who Amazon is here, uh, but we all know that the Amazon effect is really impacting our perception on, on distribution and supply chain and has really driven a lot of the customer uh, expectations or consumer expectations. But what I will say, and I will challenge that, I think well, with, well, I know that is changing this, um, the prime delivery service. People don't want that prime. People are starting to see how much cars or how much, uh, sorry, vans are on the road, delivery services on the road. It's becoming, uh, it's becoming detrimental. So that, that, that option for, hey, we're delivering in that zone or that zip code on Wednesday, would you mind waiting to Wednesday, is now becoming more prevalent. So we're going to go into the technology. Uh, and I, I, I've broken this down into two, two key areas. I said technology, the obvious technologies, and then we'll go on to the less obvious technologies. <coughs> Excuse me. I think one of the largest trends we're seeing at the minute is autonomous mobile or AMR, mobile automation. Remo- removing that sort of um, the travel within that facility and bringing those, those goods, goods to person or assistance spots, as sometimes they're referred to as well. These are very equal efficient uh, technologies, the ability to scale up and scale down. And what I mean by that is these are mobile. You can pick them up and throw them in the back of your car. Now, I hope you've got a big car because there's some size to them. But your, the ability to scale up and scale down allows you as an organization to be agile. So if you see yourself having to increase the size of your facility or for that matter, decrease the size of your facility, the footprint of your facility and have what you see here in the right hand side, the shelving, the shelving can be brought together and compounded together and then brought out by a robot, you're reducing the overall um, facility footprint. At the end of the day, that also uh, through perpetuity reduces your, 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 your emissions to the environment as well. It's a very cost-effective solution, uh, short-term ROIs. Now I know, don't hold me accountable to this, uh, but we do see ROIs as little as one year up to three years, okay? So it's a very affordable technology. They are now looking at RAS, so robot as a service as well for the smaller SME organization. 
Next here, we see voice-enabled operations or, or, or flow. Voice is not a new technology to the market. I mean, I remember putting voice in 11, 12 years ago in my, my first supply chain job. Wasn't quite as agile and as adaptable back then, uh, but it was a technology that existed. It's very, very quick and easy uh, to onboard your new, your new employees. The training is easy. Um, your travel time within that facility is much reduced because you don't have continuous employees coming up to your, your warehouse operations office looking for seeking for more work. It is uh, continuously tasked and driven to them um, in a real life manner. But it also brings safety components. <clears throat> You're not having to work off a mobility device, you're, you're constantly focused, you're, both your hands are free, um, and you can actually do an end-to-end -end operation with voice now, uh, you know, whether or not that's receiving, cycle counting, et cetera. Um, and it keeps that, it keeps that overall uh, efficiency within that warehouse. And it's easy to operate. It's, it's a very follow the bouncing ball approach. RF mobility, another technology that's been around for longer than I've been in supply chain, put it that way. Um, a major component is this, is you're able to scan your data. You're not, how, you're not needing to do manual data entry. You're from your receival, I think uh, the, 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 the 10 key areas or business functions within supply chain that Tom mentioned earlier, each one of those can be handled through a form of mobility, whether or not that's receiving returns, picking, uh, packing, et cetera, et cetera. Each of those can be handled by one device uh, and it removes the need for data entry, but it also optimizes the facility in terms of tasking that work out to the floor, ensuring that the, the work is continuous. Um, and the devices we're getting nowadays actually have a greater capability, ability to take photos, ability to look at, or so, sorry, sign on PODs, capture paperwork from drivers and use OCR technologies, removes that need for that record system of record or that paper manual system of record. And then finally, what we're seeing is mobile smart devices access to those devices. Well, I'm not saying go give your managers or supervisors a, a commercial grade iPad, but there are, there are mobile devices out there provided by the hardware vendors, Zebra and Honeywell, that are rugged <coughs> and can be handed to the supervisors or managers that are constantly on the floor. They have their access to their data uh, that is actionable. They can capture their photos. They can look at their, their, their schedules for the day. So everything I've said here, there's not one component that requires any form of paperwork within the, within the operation. So these are the really the obvious ones. The low, I used to consider some of these low investment. Um, I mean, it's as low as you want to go or as high as you want to go. Um, but these are probably the, the more the more obvious solutions to, to removing paper from your, your facility. And then finally, or sorry, the next one is the less obvious. The, the more high cost, um, I mean, if, if I'm honest, an integrated fully supply, or sorry, integrate the full supply chain, a full end-to-end -end integration of a supply chain, it comes with cost. But what it does uh, remove through perpetuity is the need for your paperwork, Excel spreadsheets, manual data input, um, but right through from upstream and downstream, so right through from your the cotton field right to the end consumer, full end-to-end -end, uh, supply chain uh, integration. And then the digitalization of your uh, proof of deliveries and carrier paperwork removes the need for that seven-year system of record um, system of record keeping pallet spaces that are full of paper that have to be kept in the facility. It reduces your 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 need for redundant space in the in the business as well. A really interesting thing we're seeing here is reusable containers. Uh, we recently worked with an organization in, in Asia that is building. Uh, considered a reusable tote for shipping. So what happens is if you're on a subscription, uh, this tote is RFID. And when your next subscription is due, you leave the tote out and the carrier picks that up and returns it back. So you're seeing a, a, a new reusable container that, that doesn't require cardboard, doesn't require, <coughs> excuse me, doesn't require recycling, et cetera, et cetera. It can be reused, retied, and sent back to or sent to another, another, uh, sorry, another consumer. WMS sophistication. Leverage your current technologies or leverage technologies within a new WMS that can better optimize um, your packing, your operation, totally eliminating the need for any form of, of paperwork there, eliminating that need for data entry as well. Um, 
data entry is one of the killers with administration within the operation. So eliminating that and having warehouse sophistication that's also integrated into your ecosystem um, is, is a major component of optimization. Other 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 uh, variations of sort of AMR is automated sorting. So look at a, a mobile sorting unit or tabletop sorter, we, we call them, um, that brings the, hey, I packed this parcel, it takes it to the shipping area. Um, reducing that need for forklift travel time, et cetera, et cetera. And then RF enabled operation. I know there's a few skeptics out there about RF enablement. Uh, I know it's been around, technology has been around for years, but having that RF enabled operation allows us to scan, uh, sorry, allows us to really scan within our facility and one end-to-end -end, uh, sort of sweep. It allows us to uh, to parse that data end to end as well. So we see Uniqlo, um, a large a large organization, Japanese apparel brand, using end to end RFID adoption. Okay, they're able to scan a container to see what's in a container in one scan. They're able to totally <clears throat> receive that in in one hit. They put it away in 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 various hits as well. And then when they ship it and distribute it, those RFID tags are then scanned as well throughout the distribution model of or sorry distribution of the distribution lifecycle of that garment or, or, or uh, whatever it may be. Matt. So just some key takeaways here. Um, not all solutions are fit for the business operation. Before you go off and invest, we need to understand your business, um, understand if you're a furniture distributor, an AMR robot's probably not gonna be very, uh, very helpful within that operation. But if you're a retailer or you're a retailer moving into an e-tail space, consider AMR, look at that from a op labor optimization, but also eliminate any paper you have in your warehouse. Um, some of these are large investment items. I mean, they will, they will cost a lot of money, but we do see a lot of our uh, rapid ROIs in some cases. For SMEs, don't be overwhelmed. There is a lot of content. There is a lot of options out there, but take incremental steps. To, to, to better to better uh, become eco-friendly within your business, whether or not that's replace LEDs in your business, uh, or whether or not to make your step from uh, paper to mobility. Um, don't think you have to run into this, but just take incremental steps. But then also um, uh, establish a method to measure your paper-free operation against. There's no doubt about it, paper picking is the fastest form of picking, okay? And I will argue that all day. You don't have to scan. But what it does, what paper doesn't do is have those eco, or sorry, those, those optimizations and those optimizations and efficiencies upstream and downstream. It's only one component of the 10 components uh, that, that Tom mentioned in his opening slide, okay? So establish a baseline. If you're, if you're gonna measure off one, one component of your operation, it's not the right way to do it. Look at it across the board, across your whole house effectively. And I think from, on that, oh, sorry, we have a real life story. I apologize. So I wanted to just talk the real life stories that we've been talking about, uh, an organization that we came across a number of years ago who implemented some some new technologies into their business. Um, and this is all public information, so there's nothing here that I'm sharing that, that's fabricated. So they, they invested in new technologies and some of the consequence of this investment, a positive consequence, I don't want that to come across as a negative connotation, they eliminated 58,000 pounds of cardboard and paper waste per year from their business, which is it's, it's a massive amount. Um, they were totally, uh, <clears throat> they, were, they were able to totally eliminate all paper from their operation. So they came from a very paper centric picking, uh, sorry, receiving. They had some rudimentary picking and uh, mobility flow, but a very, uh, very uh, paper centric operation for picking, or sorry, for receiving and packing. Uh, they were able to reduce all their their packing materials, the cost of pack, sorry cost of packing, etc., through smarter packing approaches. So they used sophistication within their WMS to cartonize smarter, to 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 do better steps within that the picking. It really optimized optimized that outbound uh, stream. Uh, they reuse their totes and containers. So internally, they don't pick to a uh, cardboard; they pick to a tote, and then they, they do the sizing in the packing station. And they were still able to do all of this while maintaining their customer SLAs. And this is one of the organizations that's looking at the, the eco-friendly aspect of delivery and ensuring customer satisfaction and market perception. And I think that concludes my component. Excellent, thank you, James.